Welcome to the New Books Network. This is the New Books Network. My name is Joe Tasca. Today, I'm joined by Dr. Klaus Schmieder to talk about his book, Hitler's Fatal Miscalculation, Why Germany Declared War on the United States. Dr. Schmieder is a senior lecturer in the Department of War Studies at the Royal Military Academy Sandhurst in the United Kingdom. Dr. Schmieder, thanks so much for taking the time today. My pleasure. Dr. Schmieder, first off, why did you write this book? Why was it important for you to explore this question of why Hitler declared war on the United States back in December of 1941? Perhaps you could begin by telling us about that conversation you had with your father as you were walking the family dog as a child. Well, I, I can't rule out that the seed may have been sown there. I mean, maybe I'm just essentially kidding myself. Uh, but yeah, I must have been nine or ten at the time. I would make it like 90, 1976. And uh, Saigon had just fallen to the North Vietnamese communists. And it, it, it's literally the first major event of world politics of which I have a very clear recollection. And I remember us discussing this while we were walking the family dog. Uh, and somehow, of course, the, the American role uh, in, in this whole disaster came up. And I made, I mean, I, I made in, in my, my the precocious doctor-to-be Klaus Schmieder made a rather <laughs> flippant comment about essentially the supposedly meddling nature of American foreign policy, like I knew the first thing about it. And my father challenged me to come up with an example. And I said, the U.S. declaration of war on Germany in 1941, of course. And he gave me an absolutely horrified look. <laughs> And it was essentially, it was in this abrupt manner that essentially I was, you could say, acquainted uh, with the fact that it was actually the other way around. And ever since then, I've, I've discovered that quite a few of my students, considerably older and much more mature than I was on that particular day, had it wrong too. It's essentially an event which seems so bizarre so counterintuitive that the only way in which you can somehow make sense of it is by essentially twisting it around. As in, yeah, of course, uh, of course the Americans declared war on Germany because that's what they did in 1917 and it's the only logical explanation, etc., 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 etc. Surely the Germans wouldn't. And then, of course, you realize that they did. Uh, <laughs> Now, I can't claim that essentially I uh, that I somehow consciously clung to this thought for the next 30 years or so. Uh, it may have been there in my subconscious. It is perfectly possible. In, in fact, I like to think so. But what happened in my, in you could say, in the conscious world is that uh, I was tasked with essentially writing a monograph on warlord Hitler, uh, which ended up going absolutely nowhere uh, because I I discovered that uh, there was two way there were two ways of approaching this: writing it from secondary sources, which didn't appeal to me, or writing it mostly from primary sources, which would take between 20 and 30 years if you're going to do it properly, because you basically need a chapter on foreign policy. You need uh, a chapter on the armaments industry. You arguably need a chapter on weapons design because of the idiosyncratic role he played there. You need a chapter on coalition politics. All this essentially worked from primary sources. I mean, you're literally talking a couple of decades here. Uh, and so in the end, I abandoned the project. I, I told the publisher that essentially uh, I was basically running up the white flag of surrender. I um, I returned the down payment they had given me, but I was left with one chapter. But one chapter I had already written. Uh, 
which lo and behold turned out to be the one on, yes, you guessed it, the declaration of war on the United States. Ah. And yeah, maybe, maybe essentially that exchange with my father had finally borne fruit because I had to choose a particular subject. I could just as easily have picked, like I said, weapons design or the Battle of Stalingrad or anything. Uh, but no, I mean, in my in a very idiosyncratic kind of way, without anybody you could say ushering me or pushing me, I had picked this particular subject. And seeing as I was left marooned with this well, outline of a chapter, uh, it, it kind of got under my skin. And I decided, okay, at some point, we're going to have to carry on with this. And well, lo and behold, it turned into a, a whole book. That's fascinating. And uh, it resulted in a 550 page volume in the end. Now, early in this book, Dr. Schmieder, you note that many other historians have tried to answer the same question that you try to tackle in your book, at least maybe not in a full volume, but they've touched on it in their own individual works. Talk yeah. about some of the prevailing theories that are out there for why Hitler declared war on the United States and which theory has sort of gained the most currency over the years? Um, I'd say the, the one that has lasted the longest is the one which was pioneered by Andreas Hillgruber back in uh, back in the 1960s, that basically this is uh, Hitler more or less realizing uh, that he's running out, that he's just run out of road. Uh, that essentially he's got nowhere left to go uh, and pretty much deciding to bring the house down in style, which needless to say is nihilistic nonsense. It's nihilistic ahistorical nonsense. And I admire Andreas Ilgruber, but if he were around today, he would agree with me. I mean, when it, granted it's December forty-one, you're not quite where you're not quite where you intended to be. But it's, I mean, let's face it: you've got an army group parked outside Moscow, twenty miles away from the Kremlin. That is not exactly the sort of strategic situation which would make you fall into a deep depression. I mean, it's not <laughs> like you don't have options here. You are basically a de facto superpower. You have the entirety of Europe in your pocket or under your gun. So it it, it beggars belief to me how essentially this uh, theory could ever have gained traction. I put it down to the fact that essentially it gave people... Uh, who most most of whom had very little insight into military history, uh, the chance to, um, oh God, wield another weapon against somebody who has already who has already earned uh, you could say a thoroughly, richly deserved reputation for being one of the most loathsome characters of twentieth century. Uh, history you're not going to be too inclined to be analytical when essentially dissecting his decision making i mean surely any new evidence that essentially comes your way it has to indicate that he was even worse than you already thought so essentially just keep on you know, i mean you'd uh, keep up the momentum okay keep up on the mo the momentum this is also time where basically you could say many surviving German generals and admirals are still around, having penned their memoirs. They inform and influence the historical narrative to a considerable extent. And those that do engage with the question also give you a lot along the lines of, uh, well, he was a madman and he never asked me or I told him not to. But it's basically, it's untenable. It's untenable. Uh, I like to think um, I, I've, I've managed to slay this particular dragon for good. <laughs> Indeed. Now you cite... An argument mm. by, I believe it was put forth by Brendan Sims. Yeah. Claimed that 
Hitler's anti-American views from his early days as a politician contributed to his decision to declare war. But you can test the premise of that hypothesis, arguing that Hitler had this great admiration for the United States. So I'll ask you, what exactly did Hitler admire about the Americans and what proof uh, do we have for this? Well, you certainly, well, you, you, yes, in short, that's essentially where Professor Sims and I uh, are on the same page, where, where it basically comes down to the fact that essentially you have far, far, far too many Hitler, bi Hitler biographies and general histories of World War II out there that insist that, well, this guy never was able to get the United States uh, because, well, he was basically a racist and an anti-Semite, uh, and that's why he was, you could say, intellectually incapable of, you could say, engaging uh, with any kind of society that, well, you could say, that wasn't his own. Uh, never mind one that, in terms of being a bul bulwark of democracy, was uh, uh, thoroughly, thoroughly alien to him. Um, but that's plain wrong. Okay, uh, we have got a multitude of sources, and the important thing is the uh, the diversity. We're talking about. Uh, personal diaries of hangers-on, we're talking about public speeches, uh, we're talking about recorded conversations, we're talking about the draft of another volume of Mein Kampf, and they all absolutely coincide on the key point. He's a genuine admirer of the United States, but in the way you admire, shall we say, a well-designed car. This is not to me. This is this can't shouldn't be. This should not be taken to mean that he's an admirer of, you could say, the United States democratic institutions or its rule of law. He, what he does admire is basically the power of American industry. What he does admire is it the American pension for bringing forth more and more technological innovations for, uh, for essentially pushing technological boundaries, especially where motor transport and flight are concerned. That's something which he admires, and he is perf perfectly capable of doing the maths. Essentially, he essentially consistently points out, not only do these people have as much access to the latest high tech as we do, they are also like uh, four, three to four times our size, which means they benefit from economies of scale, which we will never half they are the power to watch should we ever get a power for global domination it's going to be them dr schmieder you talk about hitler's pervasive fear of an untimely death yeah how did that fear impact his desire to create this german empire and also how did it impact his decision to declare war on the united states if at all um, well, we certainly have proof uh, of this essentially playing a role in the late 1930s. And I'm, I can't rule out that it may have been somewhere in the back of his mind in the autumn of 1941. Uh, but there is no proof. There's really no indication. Um, it would have been far more plausible to assume that he had somehow learned in the weeks before Pearl Harbor, that he was suffering uh, from idiopathic Parkinson's because the very, very first symptoms were already there as a renowned uh, neurologist at Cologne University, Ellen Gibbels, uh, discovered in the 1990s. Uh, but I, I think I can safely say that I've laid that uh, to rest. Uh, on the day he declared war on the United States, he was completely unaware of the fact that he was already showing the very first, admittedly very mild, symptoms of Parkinson's. As for as for cancer, can't rule it out. But you, I mean, it, as far as the year 1941 is concerned, for every Hitler quote that appears to indicate 
aggressive designs against the USA, I can give you two or even three, which indicates the desire to essentially keep them at bay, yes, but at peace. Now, once the Japanese attacked Pearl Harbor, Hitler had this decision to make. How did he assess the American strategy following Pearl Harbor? And how did that assessment compare to that of other German officials? As far as we know, and keep in mind, uh, this question is a very difficult one to answer, uh, because any other leader, even a dictatorial one, prior to making such a decision, would have been expected to, shall we say, get together for a day at least with his with his foreign secretary and the service chiefs uh, to essentially trash out strategic options before jumping in his uh, in his Mercedes and then driving to the Kroll Opera to read out the declaration of war. And that never happened, okay? That never happened. The The only thing that happened in those days was that essentially Rome, Berlin, and Tokyo agreed on a new version of the tripartite pact, which would cover this particular contingency which had arisen. There was no essentially powwow with, you could say, the big movers and shakers in Nazi Germany uh, to maybe trash out whether this was really a good move and if so, what advantages or disadvantages it might bring. What I can say is that he was under the impression that the Americans absolutely needed to defend Southeast Asia because of the natural rubber there. The Americans essentially had the beginnings of a synthetic rubber industry, but they were lagging behind quite badly behind the Germans. They would catch up in 43 and 44, but that essentially that was not foreseeable at the time. So the way he could see it is that Granted, the Japanese might not sweep through Southeast Asia like they would end up doing, but Southeast Asia would be turned into a war zone. That much essentially was money in the bank. And that in turn meant that in order to hold on just to, like, shall we say, chunks of Malaya or the Dutch East Indies, the Americans would have to fling not just their navy, but most of their half-prepared army and air force into the Pacific theater. That was only a reasonable assumption. You know, I want to get back to this idea of Hitler's admiration for the United States, because I think this is really important in this discussion. Yeah. Can you talk about some of the policies of the U.S. at the time in late 1941 that Hitler was particularly fond of? Well, we know for a fact that essentially he was genuinely fond, and not just, you could say, in a merely technical sense, of the racist uh, legislation uh, that essentially still played such a major part in American public life, both as, you could say, as far as keeping immigrants with a certain race, racial background out of the country, as well as keeping African Americans in a state of, you could say, second class citizens. Now, that is something he repeatedly referred to in an approving kind of way. Uh, it, it wasn't really well known until a few years ago when a small monograph on the subject uh, appeared that essentially a, a delegation uh, of German uh, ju uh, jurists toured a large part of the United States in pretty sure it was 1935 or 1936. And essentially what they asked to be shown was the existing legislation on racial purity in many states, especially the Deep South. And the astonishing thing is that these guys, of course, they drew up a report. And you're not going to believe what it said. 
it basically said, well, as far as the American legislation on, how we say, intermarriage between races is concerned on what this entails, for instance, for the children and grandchildren uh, of such a couple, uh, oh my God, the Americans are, I mean, total extremists. They've gone completely over the top. I mean, you can literally find yourself branded as second class citizen if you're just one hundredth of African American blood running through your veins. This is completely over the top. This is a grotesque exaggeration. Sure, sure, we agree with the spirit behind this, and it is to be applauded, but surely we shouldn't take things to such extremes. You cited a book that Hitler admired that was written by an American eugenicist. What was that book, and who was the author? Uh, oh, you've blindsided me here. Um, you're right. Um, you are absolutely right. Madison this Grant, is... does that sound familiar? Madison Grant? I'm pretty sure you've got it right. Yeah, Grant, you're right. You're right. Spot on. Yes, it was Grant. Uh, and they even corresponded. Yes. Grant is essentially is an interesting case because you could say uh, the way he described the future of the Caucasian race meshed with a lot of Hitler's thinking. Um, we have this idea that somebody like Hitler with his, you could say, ideological setup is all about the master race, the master race, the master race, the master race, the all-conquering master race. Uh, but that's just one flip side to this particular coin. Both Grant and Hitler were having considerable anxiety attacks about the future of that Caucasian master age, which to them seemed far from assured, because as they, as far as they were able to assess, any number of, you could say, countries populated by whites were under assault from any number of directions, and people weren't really paying enough attention to this particular topic. So this is an in, it's an interesting, you could say, um, studying contrasts where we're talking about people who just can't get enough of the notion that their race is superior to all others and then some, but at the same time they're having kittens at the prospect of essentially sharing their space with even a minority uh, of another ethnic background, never mind accepting the idea of intermarriage and relationships. So we have, you could say, the anxiety sitting right next to the idea, totally inflated idea of a superior race. It doesn't quite make sense, but that's essentially what we're left with. And Grant had this anxiety and essentially poured it into a book, and Hitler essentially uh, found himself in complete agreement. Now, Dr. Schmieder, what were Hitler's impressions of the Japanese at this time, December 1941? Did Hitler trust the Japanese, and how I did... I would say it's certainly somewhere between pragmatism and cynicism. Uh, I know there's a school of thought out there uh, that maintains that essentially he was a big fan, okay? That he was a big fan, essentially, of the Japanese nation, that he saw them as super warriors, uh, that essentially he got sold on the idea of Imperial Japan by the outcome of the Russo-Japanese War, which he had witnessed as a teenager, and which made a really uh, deep impression on him, etc., etc., etc. Looking at the sources closer to the time in the 30s and early 40s, I'm not, I'm not convinced. Okay, this is somebody who essentially keeps taps on Japan, who takes a keen interest in what the Japanese do, but he really only starts to reach out to them when it becomes clear, starting with the annexation of Manchuria, that essentially the Japanese are headed down a road which is likely to bring about a lasting antagonism between them and 
and their World War I allies. So what you have here is really pragmatism. At the same time, essentially getting the Japanese to commit to any kind of coalition, getting the Japanese to essentially sit down and maybe sketch out some kind of joint strategy is the equivalent of pulling teeth on a Rottweiler. It's the sort of thing you wouldn't wish on your worst enemy. The Japan of 1940 or 41 is on the other, on the one hand, it's an industrialized developed country. In every other regard, it's practically a failed state because you never know who is who essentially who is responsible for what everybody is at odds with everybody else there are cliques everywhere and it's not just the usual thing like the navy the, uh, the civilians civilian power centers against say the armed forces no it's a lot more complicated it's a lot more complicated and it's not just navy against army you have cliques and clans and interest groupings within the services as well so at any given moment in time it, it can happen that if you say the german ambassador in tokyo uh you have a chat with a Japanese admiral or foreign office official who promises you the moon with regards to, I don't know, mobilizing the army to invade the USSR or getting ready to invade Malaya, or who knows both. And then three days later, you learn from another source uh, that none of this is going to happen anytime soon. And that's essentially, if you're the German ambassador or one of the ser service attaches, in Tokyo, that's essentially your daily bread. You get you get this day in, day out. And there's absolutely zero prospect of somebody at some point, more or less, you could say, breaking this logjam. As far as you can make out, you are caught in a nightmare version of Groundhog Day. And there's a pretty good indication that by September, October 1941, Hitler himself had reached the conclusion, you know what, I'm past caring with these people. They'll never commit to anything. So by all means, let them carry on, but don't expect me to take too much of an interest. Dr. Schmieder, can you talk a little bit about Hitler's assessment of the German war economy in December of 1941? Was he aware of the fact that war production was slowing down to a large degree in Germany. Yes, he was aware. Uh, he was aware of this. Uh, it did give him pause. He did have a number of meetings uh, with, you could say, industrial chieftains uh, on the uh, on the subject. But essentially, there were there were factors at play which basically gave him the idea that this is something which can be remedied uh first of all he had already taken some of his military chiefs to task over the fact that essentially german designs uh, literally from uh, from truck to uh, from a truck to a heavy artillery piece tended to be too fancy tended to be you could say too complicated to facilitate mass production or easy servicing in the field and he had repeatedly drawn attention to this and basically uh, as far back as april 1941 and basically said listen we still have slack in the system uh, but not until we essentially remedy this particular problem and in fact most historians today would agree uh, they would say that he had exactly the right idea that there essentially that there was essentially uh, too much uh, slack and waste in the system, and this is uh, certainly appro uh, approaching this particular aspect was the right way to go about it. 
The other thing you have to keep in mind that as far as making a momentous strategic move while the economy was really underperforming, he had already been here before. Why? Because a similar crisis of production occurs in pretty much, shall we say, February, March, April 1940, just before uh, the attack on Western Europe. And there again, it was felt that the reasons for this have been identified and that essentially this particular logjam would eventually sort itself out in the same way as the previous one had. So keep in mind that in April 1940, uh, Germany is basically ruling the Czech half of Czechoslovakia and two thirds of Poland. And that's it. Okay, we're talking about the eve of the invasion of Scandinavia. So if anything, moving on Western Europe, while your economy is underperforming, would would be seen as something far more daunting uh, than 19 months later, when basically you're ruling the entirety of the continent and you're planning to declare war on the US. About this time, you get, he, put it, he put it rather well to one of his essentially overlords in October 41, where it was pointed out to him that essentially production wasn't meeting this target, product production was meeting that target. And essentially he barked at him, how can the industry be short of this or that? Have you taken a look at a map lately? We're ruling the entire continent. <laughs> get on, get on with your job. And frankly, to some extent, he had a point. Now, so far, Dr. Schmieder, we haven't talked much about the Soviet Union's role in all of yeah. this. The war in Russia would, of course, take a turn against the Germans in 1942 and into 43, but things were looking fairly promising in early December 41, as you alluded to earlier in our conversation. The question is, did Hitler suspect any trouble on the horizon, militarily speaking, in the East? And was he on the same page as his generals and other German officials? Well, basically, um, as far as I'm concerned, this is the most uh, important factor in the decision. And it is the one which has begun hiding in plain sight for almost 80 years. It was always assumed that, well, let's see, the Soviet winter offensive starts on December 5th or 6th, depending on essentially which particular sector you count. I mean, the Soviet counter-strike on December 5th is in a sector which had already been heating up for weeks. So it should most many historians have argued that it shouldn't really count. So let's just say December 6th, okay? The thing is that you can do a troll of publications on World War II, whether biographies of Hitler, biographies of Stalin, general histories of World War II, one-volume histories, multi-volume histories, and they will virtually all give you the same routine as in on December 5th or 6th, a hundred divisions of the Red Army rise as literally like ghostly apparitions and rush across the snow to crush the Germans. <laughs> uh, and it is possible to essentially trace back this particular pigment of someone's imagination, because that's what it is, uh, to its original source, which is something which historians like to do. Uh, this particular phrase about 100 Red Army divisions featured in the first Red Army bulletin, news bulletin, which basically formally meant that the Red Army was essentially nailing its colors to the mast. The first 
six, seven days of this counteroffensive were basically a series of haphazard localized counterattacks. Crucially, the biggest German formation, 4th Army, in the center of Army Group Center, remains completely untouched. And for the Germans, this is a case of, yeah, been there, done that, got the T-shirt. <laughs> because this is a very Red Army thing to always counterattack, even if more often than not, this is just going to mean a world of pain and hurt for them. But it, it's not irrational because they struggle to keep up with the Germans whenever they are maneuvering. So whenever the Germans literally just settle down, even if it's just for a few days, whammo, you will get the Red Army counterattack like clockwork. So this for the Germans is nothing you could say spectacular that they've been there before. They've had far, far more violent Red Army counteroffensives directed against them in August 1941, both in the sectors of Army Group Center and Army Group North. It's only about eight, nine days into this counteroffensive that two things happen. The Soviets counterattack across the entire breadth of Army Group Center. Number two, the Soviet leadership publicly commits to this being something new, different, and big. This is the day when all of a sudden you get a statement from Radio Moscow making reference to the fact that a hundred divisions have been attacking since December 6th. But this does not reflect the reality on the ground. It certainly reflects the reality for many divisional commanders who are screaming bloody murder. But if you go through the sources that essentially give you an insight into the minds of essentially first the German army chief of staff at the very top, and then the army group commanders, army commanders, assorted staff officers, for the period of December 6th, to at least December 13th, these men are largely unconcerned. Granted, after December 13th, this will change, <laughs> and quite dramatically. But not between December 6th and December 13th, arguably even a little bit beyond that. You could even stretch it to from December 6th to December 16th, which is when Hitler finally issues his, his uh, dramatic hold order. And needless to say, you could say those officers who uh, survived the war and were still around after 1945 quite emphatically insisted that they saw it coming and that they'd been warning about this and that Führer's head, and at Führer's headquarters nobody was picking up the phone. But we have a plethora of collections of letters, office diaries, personal diaries, from many of the key players, and they are not alarmed. It's simply not true. And they're certainly not alarmed to the extent that anybody would dream of essentially telling their lord and master, listen, the Soviets are not just getting their second wind, they're getting their fourth, fifth, and sixth wind all in one. You really, really need to start to rethink your military priorities. Mm. By the time they've connected all these dots, it's too late. The declaration of war against the U.S. is already in the post. It's amazing how just a couple of days can impact history. Um, certainly five or six days, yes. Dr. Schmieder, how did the Americans' extension of Lend-Lease shipments to the Soviets impact Hitler's decision to declare war? Did he think that American aid to Russia would make much of a difference to the Soviet war effort at this point? As far as we can tell, probably not. It's something which is carefully monitored, but based on admittedly incomplete evidence, I would say that essentially it was not seen as a major concern, not pre-December 11th. 
it was basically seen as yes they're going to get a trip a trickle of equipment but it's not it's not going to be nearly enough these guys need several thousand tanks not just a hundred or two hundred and they need them like yesterday so this stuff is going to arrive too late and not in nearly large enough numbers so frankly we don't need to worry too much this changes in the second half of december 1941 when all of a sudden the japanese representatives in berlin are prevailed upon to do something uh, like blockading vladivostok or perhaps essentially engaging then least shipments headed for the persian gulf with their long-range submarines but this does not really start to happen until well into the second half of december so basically somebody has reconsidered yes but it's too late again too late by literally five six days hitler's declaration of war on the United States seems even more bizarre when you consider the fact that, as you spoke to earlier, he seemingly tried to keep the Americans out of the war for the previous couple of years. Did he see war with the United States as inevitable on December 11th, 1941, especially considering the extension of Lend-Lease to the Soviets and as you point out and discuss at length in the book, the dismantling of the neutrality law in November in the U.S. The, the last point is key. Uh, the last point is is absolutely key. And uh, I think I can, uh, I can safely say that I'm the first one uh, to have identified this. I mean, um, uh, the, uh, the historians who came before me always insisted uh, that, yeah, sure, um, Hitler was convinced that war with the U.S. was inevitable. End of story. Uh, but at some point, this sort of this sort of thing becomes a platitude. At some point, you need to essentially commit nail your colors to the mast and basically say, when exactly does he get this idea that war with the U.S. is probably inevitable? And if you look at the conjunction of events at Führer's headquarters, and uh, where regrettably we don't have like a, a source that gives you everything as, as far as the comings and goings of various individuals are concerned. Uh, but essentially, if we pool several sources, we get a pretty good idea of what was happening there in November, early December 1941. And it is absolutely clear that there's a conjunction between A, the Americans dismantling what was left of their neutrality legislation, three days of, shall we say, confusion, bewilderment, shoot, what should we do, until the offer from Tokyo comes along. An offer from Tokyo, which I seriously doubt would have been accepted a couple of weeks earlier. I really don't see the evidence. Uh, the Germans had been, at that one point, and it was, you could say, it was a fleeting moment in April 1941 when Hitler offered the Japanese foreign secretary a German declaration of war if the Americans were to decide to basically hit the Japanese during a war of conquest of Southeast Asia. Mind you, a war of conquest which had spared American possessions like the Philippines. Now, if the Americans were literally to jump you, then we would help you. But that's like a light year away from the situation that produce, essentially uh, produces itself in November 41. Here, the Japanese basically tell the Germans nothing more than, we'll probably go to war against the Americans sometime very soon. No specifics, no hint as to the Pearl Harbor rate or anything like that. And at the time, you don't have a treaty. You don't have a treaty that in any shape or form obliges you to essentially take your cue from this. And at the same time, you have essentially a year's worth of diplomatic precedent where you've consistently tried to steer the Japanese away from war with the United States. And now all of a sudden you have a change of heart? Obviously, because of what happened a few days earlier, the Americans dismantling 
the remnants of their neutrality legislation. Dr. Schmieder, let's talk about Britain's role here. This is a country that survived the Blitz the year before, but in December of 1941, a German intelligence report indicated that the Royal Navy was on the ropes despite U.S. assistance in the Atlantic. Did Hitler think that the Brits could be effectively neutralized if the Japanese joined the cause? And was this part of the calculus for Hitler in declaring war on the United States? I can't rule it out. A number of historians have made that point. But there is no proof. It's something you can infer. This, there is no source that actually ascend, that actually states this in so many words, or no, or even in a in a in a roundabout sort of way. Uh, the source you are alluding to is probably that intelligence report, uh, which I quote from in in miscalculation. And if I had to hazard a guess, I would say that it was almost certainly a British plant. Ah. And at some point, somebody really needs to write the history behind this document. Uh, what we do know is that it essentially arrived just in time at Führer's headquarters to influence the discussion, or whatever discussion there may have been, on how to assess American intentions. And this report clearly spells out, well, the Americans, they're coming, they're coming in strength. Uh, they're essentially, first of all, they're merchantmen, and very soon they will bring their own escorts and all the way into British ports. And now this is by itself, I mean, it's just a confirmation what intelligence on the ground had already revealed since mid-September. Uh, but it basically, yeah, it would have solidified a certain conception as in yeah right i mean they're coming they're already getting comfy in uh, in iceland very soon they will have bases in scotland and northern ireland uh I, mind you i don't think the germans were quite as worried about sinking an american warship which is what this report essentially uh makes hay of uh, they are far more concerned about a Lusitania-type incident. Yes. I mean, this is, as somebody or as somebody of Hitler's generation would have had the Lusitania, you could say, seared into his mind. And he just basically uh, has become aware of the fact that the Americans uh, are surprisingly philosophical about his U-boats drilling U.S. destroyers with their torpedoes, but that they get incredibly antsy where civilian shipping is concerned. There's a, there's a close synchronicity between the torpedoing of American merchantmen in the Atlantic in 1941 and Roosevelt essentially being given a break by Congress or other power uh, groups in passing new legislation or essentially or, or basically getting the country on site uh, to confront the axis powers and these essentially they, 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 none of these none of these incidents uh, are very famous today we're not talking about lusitania type incidents i mean in each case only a handful of lives was lost but they made front page news in the us and they were basically a major shot. every single one of these incidents was a major shot in the arm for the roosevelt administration's policy of confronting Germany. Now, imagine what would have happened if you get like one of these incidents, but times 20 with like a thousand civilians dead, because sooner or later you'll get passenger liners uh, sailing all across the Atlantic together with merchantmen. And then, yes, uh, based on precedent, based on what you witnessed yourself in 1915 and 1917, it's, it's difficult to escape the conclusion that this will bring about a declaration of war. It's either that or you basically uh, you stand down the German submarine force. Dr. Schmieder, 
Hitler seemed to think the Germans had the upper hand in the air war as well in December 1941. He obviously held Hermann Göring in high esteem, the head of the Luftwaffe at this time anyway. What were these two men thinking about the effectiveness of the RAF in December 1941? Uh, that's an interesting one. Uh, it I mean, originally, if you look at the reaction of the German power elite to the first Royal Air Force bombing raids against German urban areas, they seem almost farcically overwrought. I mean, this is a phase which starts May, for, May 1940, doesn't really come to an end till February 1942, where Bomber Command, for all its efforts, struggles to hit the floor when it falls out of bed in the morning. They really, really struggle to make a major dent in either German morale or German war production. They are basically limited to operating at night over Germany. And most of the time, they struggle to find cities never mind individual shipyards or factories but whenever they do hit a target just ever so slightly people in berlin including the big muckety mucks literally start to panic and that to us is ludicrous because we tend to think of world war ii air warfare as dresden and hiroshima but dresden and hiroshima in early 1941 is not even an hg wells fantasy it's something that is so far removed from anybody's conception of what air power can or ought to be doing uh that frankly it's silly to use this as a yardstick so basically as 1941 progresses the Germans pull out all stops in order to find a check on the British bombing offensive. It's literally inflicting not that many casualties on the German civilian population, but the Nazi elite is concerned. The Nazi elite is concerned by the persistence of this offensive, and they fear that they have to do their level best to essentially up somehow up keep up civilian morale i mean this is almost touching okay this is a totalitarian state which essentially has the gestapo on hand to quell any kind of dissent yet at the same time they're incredibly anxious not to put, to put too much strain on civilian morale uh, i know it doesn't seem to make much sense but we are where we are then by november 41 Essentially, it's fair to say Bomber Command's night bombing offensive is successfully checked in, it's in uh, for a number of reasons. Uh, one of them being the introduction of the Würzburg ground radar, which is the first radar in the world at the time, which is accurate enough that you can actually make use of it for gun laying. And essentially, that means a sharp increase in Bomber Command's uh, fatality rate and we have got Hitler on record around the turn of the year 1941-42 was actually saying to some acolytes I actually overdid it with my production orders for anti-aircraft shells I mean not quite sure what we're going to do with them the British have basically been checked and at the time, that's broadly speaking true. Uh, something else, there, there is total less of three new aircraft types in the pipeline, of which great things are expected. And all three of them will turn out to be great disappointments. Two in particular uh, were basically going to be absolute pillars of the Luftwaffe of 1942-43. And they turn out to be massive disappointments. And that is something that nobody can foresee in early December 1941. I mean, it's basically a tick in the box, tick in the box, tick in the box. Nobody has an intimation of the fact that both the Messerschmitt 210 and the Heinkel 177 will turn into the equivalent of flying coffins for their crews. Is it also fair to say that the Germans underestimated the long-term impacts of the four-engine bombers that started to appear in the fall of 41? Um, that is a bit more difficult 
uh, because basically there were a lot depends a lot depends uh, on one particular quote which we have from the Ribbentrop memoirs and even the, you can read this quote 20 times and you can you could say squint your eyes and hold it up against the light uh, it's impossible to say whether Ribbentrop was paraphrasing a conversation he had with Hermann Goering before or after the declaration of war on the United States um, my best bet is that as of yet, the first few four-engine bombers that had appeared in German-controlled skies, and we're talking about a handful, the early versions of the Boeing B-17, which incidentally uh, was a major disappointment, a handful of short Sterlings, not even sure whether the first couple of Halifaxes ever got essentially as far as an operational sortie or two before Pearl Harbor. I'd say no. Uh, but on balance, I'd say they are their contribution is subsumed into what is seen as the larger phenomenon of you could say British air power, British strategic air power having failed by late November 1941. Dr. Schmieder, some historians have gone on the record over the years saying Hitler waged his war against the United States in particular in an effort to fully unleash the Holocaust. Now, until December of 1941, Hitler was considered by many to be using European Jews as sort of hostages to influence U.S. foreign policy. But his declaration of war seems to indicate that, as we spoke about earlier, perhaps he resigned himself to U.S. intervention at this point. What were the factors that influenced the evolution of the Holocaust? Uh Okay, you have to you have to keep in mind that with, with very with only a couple of exceptions, uh, Chris Browning comes to mind here. Mm -hmm. uh, Holocaust historians and World War II historians have, you could say, just coexisted side by side. They essentially would tolerate each other's presence. They don't necessarily take on board what the others have to contribute. Um, I. I would say that definitely there's a, there's a lot to be said for the hostage theory. The idea that essentially declaring war on the United States is somehow going to help you with the Holocaust uh, or is somehow going to be somehow going to be fuel for greater radicalization or will somehow put you in a position to reach Jewish victims in places you places you might otherwise not have gone I mean strikes me as preposterous I mean you have basically the beginnings of the deportation uh, of German Austrian and Czech Jews and they are the ones that seen as you could say they are seen as key in this. They are seen Jews already being murdered in 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 tens of, in their tens of thousands in the occupied parts of the Soviet Union from August 1941 onwards. But the Nazi elite feels that essentially um, the one thing that is going to move the needle. Uh, of American outrage is the deportation, let alone mass murder, of Western and Central or European Jews. And in October 1941, you have a confluence of factors that leads to Hitler basically okaying the first deportations of German Jews. As far as we can tell, he is still hesitating on turning this into mass murder. I would say that you have at least six, six, seven weeks, if not more, of a sort of, shall we say, gray area period where he himself is trying to make up his mind. As in, yeah, right, we have, we have uh, marginalized these people, we have turned them into third-class citizens, now we have actually started to deport them, 
not quite sure what will happen next. And yeah, sure. I mean, uh, these people do arrive in East European ghettos, but they're not shot. Not straight away. The people who are murdered are the East European Jews who are herded into those, those ghettos and they are murdered. So place can be made for Jewish Germans. And it's really only um, it's really only after Pearl Harbor that mass shootings of Jewish Germans become routine. Not before. There is one instance where it does happen, uh, but uh, this appears to essentially have been triggered by somebody getting the wrong end of the stick where Japanese commitment to the war was concerned. It, it's basically... It's basically a story of the. It comes down. It comes down to the Japanese ambassador in Berlin being left out of, you could say, uh, this as a cycle of communications, and basically giving a briefing uh, to the German foreign minister, uh, which is totally misleading. Which appears to indicate no, Japan is not going to jump. Which again chimes rather well with the previous year and a half, where you could say we've had we've had conflicting evidence from any number of Japanese uh, uh, spokespeople, and which when when all things are considered, never amounted to a hill of beans. So basically, a number of people on the German side uh, are basically left with the uh, with the idea that oh my god, I mean they're getting cold feet again while essentially orders for mass shootings have already been issued and that essentially you have the first 5,000 Jewish German victims of the Holocaust are basically shot by mistake and there's actually a, a, a bit of a kerfuffle among a, a number of Holocaust perpetrators on the spot about who gave the order, who gave permission, uh, this can't be right, uh, you'll never hear the end of this, etc., 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 until a week later, uh, the events of Pearl Harbor bulldozed this into history. But it is a very important moment, but essentially, so far, nobody has caught on, on to the fact that you can trace it back to the Japanese ambassador giving the Germans uh, a completely misleading appreciation of the situation in the Far East because he's basically been left out of the loop. Well, Dr. Schmieder, we've certainly covered a lot of ground today in our conversation, but to sum up your thesis, is it safe to say that you see the Hitler declaration of war on the United States not as an admission of defeat or this gesture of solidarity with Japan, but as more of an opportunistic gamble? Yeah, it's an opportunistic gamble, and it's basically, God, how best to put this? Uh, some time ago, um, there, there was a big debate about uh, among World War One historians whether you could say the dynamic that led uh, to the events of July 1914, with you could say all kinds of powers in Europe turning on each other and, dec and declarations of war uh, flying every which way, whether that could be explained by the concept of a window of opportunity. And there were there was a very interesting article. I could literally, I would struggle to source it now. Uh, but basically the colleague who penned this article gave it the title, Windows of Opportunity do states jump through them? And my answer would be yes. Uh, sometimes they do. And in this I, I, and I dare say that this is in fact uh, uh, the best such example you're going to find in in all of 20th century history because all the stars needed to align. Okay, all the stars needed to align, as in you needed to be under the impression that the fighting in Russia, while not quite finished, was basically you were basically three quarters there. Okay, not quite finished, but good enough for government work. You were not in Moscow, you parked just outside, but you'd basically done most of the heavy lifting. At the same time, you needed to be under the impression uh, that, well, guess what? 
if the Americans come for us, we are going to have an enormous U-boat fleet ready and waiting for them. You don't know yet that the next winter headed your way is going to collapse your training program. At the same time, you don't realize that the Russians are about to get their third and fourth wind, which is going to play havoc with you restructuring the Wehrmacht with a view to fighting an air and naval campaign. At the same time, you've got this curious position that, yes, you've got this coincidence of the Japanese finally getting ready to commit to anything, while at the same time, the Americans have just dismantled the, rema the remainder of their neutrality legislation. Now, all these things need to come together, and they come from disparate directions. And I dare say that, essentially, if you just look at this problem uh, the way a Holocaust historian would or the way a, a, a historian of the Third Reich's economy would or a historian of Axis coalition politics would, you will never get the whole picture. You need all these disparate strands to come together because they, were, they all had a key part to play in bringing about, bringing the, this, you could say, unique window of opportunity or what appeared to be a window of opportunity hesitate for literally a week and it collapses okay hesitate for a week and you realize that oh my god you've got a tiger by the tail outside moscow no don't think you will be redirecting hundreds of thousands of men to shipyards and aircraft factories anytime soon uh, wait another week and you will see how the U-boat training program uh, collapses because all of a sudden the, Bo uh, the entire Baltic Sea is essentially icebound. Uh, wait another week or two and you'll see how Messerschmitt 210 prototypes start dropping out of the sky and so on and so on and so on. It had to be precisely at this moment in time. Not sooner, not later. And literally all the stars had to align. Change something and you get a different outcome. I'm convinced that essentially uh, the, the American ambassador uh, would have been invited to the Rice Chancellery uh, uh, for a bit of Kaffee mit Schlag and lots and lots and lots of Schadenfreude, which is the most German of all sentiments. <laughs> uh, and essentially being told, yeah, so sorry, we just heard you had a bit of unpleasantness with our Japanese coalition partners. Listen, we don't want you to get the idea that this was our doing. Have a nice day. Uh, but I don't think there would have been a declaration of war. Fascinating. The book is called Hitler's Fatal Miscalculation, Why Germany Declared War on the United States. Dr. Klaus Schmieder is a senior lecturer in the Department of War Studies at the Royal Military Academy, Sandhurst, in the United Kingdom. Dr. Schmieder, thanks so much for doing this. It was a great pleasure. My pleasure. Thank you very much.